Welcome back everybody, this is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today I've got a very special video for you and I've got a special guest. This is Matt here with Air Arms Hunting SA out of South Africa and we're going to be discussing today South African gun laws as well as a little bit of South African hunting culture and some of the things I know a lot of folks probably have questions about hunting laws because lots of folks like to go on safari and take uh, hunting trips out to Africa, primarily South Africa as well. And we thought it'd be cool, you know, Matt's got a great YouTube channel, does a lot of wonderful work, uh, kind of lifestyle hunting thing, you know, also air guns, powder burners, long range shooting, lots of really cool things. Thanks for coming on uh, today with me. Yeah, uh, firstly, thanks for having me here. Of course. And it's always a privilege to be in America, and I think one of my favorite uh, parts about flying over to the States is seeing that about half the flight from Johannesburg to Atlanta is, are just hunters um, returning from South Africa, mm -hmm. and I'm able to have open conversations with them about guns and hunting and stuff, so yeah, Absolutely. I love being over here. Yeah, man, thanks for coming. So how do you say hello in South Africa? Uh, in Afrikaans, we'll say Goeiemorgen, means good morning. Okay, yeah. <laughs> cool. Now, now what, what's a cool town to visit? Uh, well, <laughs> one I would want to mention is Twee Buffels met een skoort, sorry, Twee Buffels met een skoort Mors doodgeskiet fontein, which means two buffaloes shot completely dead with one shot by a fountain. So that's a town. It's <laughs> an actual town. Really? Yeah. So I would imagine booking a flight to that town might be a little cumbersome if you don't. Oh, I think you're going to need to drive there because it's in the middle of nowhere. Oh, really? Okay. I <laughs> yeah. would imagine a town like that with a name like that, it's probably in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Very cool. So um, when we get into these types of videos, in case you guys don't know, I usually will bring in a guest who is usually from the host country. So he's representing South Africa today, and we discuss various things. Uh, that differ between laws here and laws that they have to follow there. Now, since Matt is such an avid hunter, we thought it'd be fun to kind of break down some of the hunting regs and other things. So let's start with, okay, a guy wants to get on a flight and go over to South Africa and go hunting. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the things that he's probably gonna have to go through? Or, or where do you think you should start there? I mean, would it be okay. what somebody does post-flight before they come over for a trip? I mean, what, what would they need to do? Yeah, my suggestion would firstly be to contact whoever you're planning to hunt with and ask them specifically. Um, I personally don't know too much about actually traveling and the procedures behind traveling with firearms, um, but the hunting lodges that you might want to go hunt with or your friends that you want to go visit, they will know about that stuff because they'll obviously get clients in all the time. Sure. Um, but I know I, I have um, spoken to many people, many friends of mine that have come over and I think it, it differs depending on what um, what province you're going to be hunting in, um, specifically with gun, with hunting laws, you'll have to maybe fill in a few forms like um, for the landowner, you, you, for example, a few things, you need written permission to hunt um, on a specific property. So there's some paperwork you'll have to do um, specific to the, the province you're going to be hunting in. But in terms of the, the firearms themselves, I would, I would r highly recommend contacting the hunting outfitter that you're going to be hunting with and and speaking to them and they will probably do a lot of the stuff for you and really help you out there. So that is a must. Don't try Google stuff and, and rely fully on that because there's a good chance that things are gonna go pear-shaped. Well, things in <laughs> Africa don't always work out to plan. So. If somebody deals in hunting on a regular basis, if they're a lodge or a guide, they're gonna know what to tell you to do, you know, in terms of traveling and everything like that. I would assume also it's probably important to mention that we're talking about South Africa specifically. Yeah. Africa doesn't have just some centralized gun law, set of laws. I mean, they're all going to be different for different places you visit in Africa. So it is a, a regional sort of thing, depending on where you go. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to go hunt in Namibia, which is one of the top hunting destinations now, um, you'll probably fly there via South Africa, but the laws in Namibia itself are going to be completely different to the laws in South Africa. I think they're fairly similar, but they will be different. So you'll need to um, the laws will be specific to whatever country you're going to go to and I don't know much about other countries' laws, I only know about South Africa, but um, yeah, they, are, they do differ, so don't confuse them. Sure, so concentrating on South Africa, I've always read that certain parts of, I mean really no matter where you go in Africa, but specifically South Africa also has, I guess for hunting, like caliber restrictions, you have to have like a minimum yeah. caliber and there's a maximum, so explain the whole caliber restriction thing for powder burners. So if you look at the hunting regulations, which are, I think they publish about once a year, sometimes once every two years, they'll update them, but they'll have a list of all the different species that you're allowed to hunt, along with um, like bag limits for each species. Um, there'll be certain restrictions. So for example, for, for many animals, they'll say you're not allowed to shoot um, after sunset or before sunrise. 
sure. um, and there'll be other animals you're not allowed to use artificial light to hunt them at night without a permit and then they'll have caliber restrictions so for example with most antelope species they'll say um, you're not allowed to hunt with 5.6 millimeters and under mm-hmm. so like a let's say a, a 204 Ruger you can't go and shoot a springbuck with a 204 Ruger um, but most small game animals, they'll, it'll say there specifically that that's exempt from that law. So if you want to go shoot ground squirrels with a 204 Ruger, that's no problem. And obviously with your larger dangerous game animals, like for example, if you want to go shoot a buffalo, uh, then you won't be able to use something like a 223. It's right, just right. not, you're not allowed to do that. So that's something to consider as well when, when deciding what rifles you want to bring over for hunting. Um, you'll need to, and again, I suggest you, you ask your um, hunting outfit you're going to be hunting with because again the laws those laws are specific to um, each province as well certain provinces have completely different hunting seasons completely different bag limits yeah so that stuff's important to note and they will be able to advise you what rifle to bring for what um, whatever species you want to hunt and they will also a lot of them actually keep a huge variety of rifles with them so that if you don't want to go through the the hassle of bringing your own guns most of them have fantastic guns that you can just use so that's yeah, also I mean, a really good option. Another thing to consider too, guys, is when you're talking hunting in South Africa, really a lot of places in Africa, I don't know if this is true across Africa, but uh, you're talking 375 Holland and Holland is light medicine. Yeah. Okay, so depending on the, the, the creature you're going after, you, you know, you may have to get up in 458 lot or 458 wind mag or, you know, some of those kind of bigger bigger cartridges and getting into the 500 A squares and the 600 overkills and that's when you yeah. get into stopping rifles, when you get into dangerous games. So. Uh, we've done some videos with uh, some big bore guns, not quite getting up into the five and 600 territory, but that's something we'll probably wind up doing. Now, uh, in terms of gun laws, yeah. uh, let, let's talk a little bit about, I mean, are there any restrictions on what you can own in terms of guns? Like, are there guns that you can't have in South Africa? Because, like, you know, in the U.S., how our gun laws are, how, yeah. how, how does it differ down there compared to what we have here? So, I know people that have just about everything you can think of, like, 50 BMG, full autos, like whatever they want, but it is quite difficult to get stuff like that. Um, it, you, you've got to go through, you've got to jump through some hoops in terms of, um, you know, you, you've got to r- reach certain criteria to be allowed to own those guns, and that might mean that you've got to write a few exams, it might mean you've got to, um, yeah, you've got to be competent to own those rifles, and that, that means you've got to go through some processes, and unfortunately, they are not necessarily difficult to apply for but the it's just the whole system is is very slow and very badly managed so even for me having to just apply for a simple bolt action rifle for hunting it's a process that will take minimum three months but often i mean some guys have been waiting over a year just to get that license back and it's difficult because you've got to physically buy the gun before you can apply for the and license. And your money's tied up. And then it. your money's tied up, the gun's stored somewhere, you've got to go through the heartache of looking at it but not being able to take it home. Um, so unfortunately, the, the way it's implemented is is the issue. The, the actual licensing itself is is pretty straightforward and pretty clear, but it's the, the implementation of that and how it's actually carried out. Unfortunately, it's just really slow and the people who are supposed to process your paperwork just take their time and, and don't really they're not very efficient in it so. so it's safe to say that firearms ownership is in itself highly regulated you mentioned that it is um, that black powders are not considered firearms so yeah, like muzzle loaders yeah. air rifles and we're going to get on to air rifles because yeah. you do a lot of work with air rifles on your channel yes. and i've watched a lot of your stuff you know you've got some really fun kind of lifestyle sort of things everything from just vlogging shooting mm. but all the way up to hunting preparing for a trip and that whole process so yeah. i know you do stuff with air rifles and powder burners but uh, what is the least regulated in terms of gun technology? I, was, I would assume air rifles and, and black powder are in the same boat? Yeah, so an air rifle by law is defined as uh, a gun that propels a projectile using compressed air, but is also under 5.6 millimeters in diameter. And then, so if you want to, for example, buy a 25 or 30 caliber air rifle, even a big bore like a, like a 9mm or 45, Technically, that is um, regarded as a firearm and you need to apply for a firearms license. For an air rifle. For an air rifle. However, it's very much a gray area that nobody understands. I have physically visited the police station to the firearms department and tried to to speak to them about this. I've highlighted parts of the Firearms Control Act and tried to ask them for information to clarify what the law says about this. 
and nobody seems to know. In fact, some some um, policemen I go to say it's not a problem. An air rifle, regardless of caliber, is not considered a firearm. And others say, like I, I mean, and others say no. You got to be very cautious about that because it's nobody seems to know what's going on. And unfortunately, as a, as a public figure, I've I've decided to just stay completely clean and and not even venture into that territory. Um, I don't want to set a bad example for people and encourage them to do something that might get them into trouble. Um, but yeah, the, the truth is, it's not very clear on the air rifle side of things. And unfortunately, if you do want to purchase a big boy air gun, it's it's very, very difficult because nobody wants to import them because of that reason. The gray it's area. The gray area, they don't want to get into trouble, so nobody's importing them. Now getting into, um, let's just talk about gun culture in general. Yeah. In South Africa, what is the gun culture like? Is, is guns one of those things where you're just riding around hunting and yeah. the police or military, whoever's around will go, okay, you're just hunting yeah. and it's no big deal? Or is it one of those things where it's one of those countries where people are like, eh, you want to be a gun owner? Like, what so, is the culture like for gun yeah. owners? So the, there's a huge gun culture in South Africa. As far as um, competitive shooting goes, um, South Africa is one of the top countries in the world. Um, actually, air rifle stuff, we're pretty good. We in the top top three um, bench rest teams like in the world over and over again, top three field target teams over and over again. We've come top three or top four for the past few um, F-class Bisley shooting nice. matches, um, uh, gallery shooting, like uh, we've got a very, very strong gun culture. And I think a lot of that stems from the, the 80s when we had the Angola Bush War where like military, there was military conscription and everyone had to, everyone was um, involved with guns and because during apartheid the, there were trade sanctions, nobody could supply us with weapons. South Africa had to develop and build their own weapons. So a lot of South African made guns. If you go to a trade show in South Africa, half the guns are made lo like locally manufactured guns. So there's a very um, strong gu gun culture there, but I'd say most of it is hunting. So the hunting culture is strong, I suppose partly because we have so many animals and such a variety of animals to shoot. But I think it's it's been a, a cultural thing for centuries. You know, you when your son turns you know, ten or thirteen years old, you take them out to shoot a to shoot their first buck, and that's something that's kind of just become tradition almost. Yeah. So I think that's really cool, um, and I suppose handguns for self defense in certain parts of the country, it's very very common for somebody to walk around concealed carry handguns, especially in the more kind of dangerous so areas wise, in the city. So culture wise, it's pretty similar to here. Yeah, except yeah, yeah. I would say. One thing you won't you won't see often in South Africa if you let's compare maybe um, American uh, gun channels and and how there's a lot of talk about um, self defense um, and there'll be a lot of tests with let's say like armor plating and and stuff like that where despite the fact that South Africa is technically a more dangerous country it doesn't seem to be something that comes up the topic of of self-defense, perhaps with handguns, but it's not really something that's spoken about much. Somebody will go and buy a handgun, but they won't really talk about it after that, whereas hunting is the big talking point. So if they, if they pull that handgun out, they're going to use it, and that's going to be the end of it to protect themselves. Yeah, they're not going to talk about it. They're not going to talk about what training they're doing. They're just going to do it. Yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned the, the youth, children. Yeah. And that's very much how it is here in the United States. I mean, yeah. a lot of us that grow up in gun families, we end up shooting our first gun when we're very young. A lot of us end up hunting when we're very young. So there's some similarities there yeah. between South Africa and the in the U.S. in terms of gun, not the gun laws, but gun culture. So that's cool. And something I think is important to talk about. You have been, and I want you guys to make sure you go over and subscribe to his channel because he's got, again, it's, it's Air Arms Hunting SA for South Africa. Uh, he has been running this channel since he was 16 years old. Yep. <laughs> so you've been at it a long time, and uh, so what? About seven years now? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say guess my age in the comments below, and then I'll I'll maybe after a few days I'll post it on you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but he's been running it right. since he was 16. I think yeah. that's so cool to to say you know a young guy starting a channel and it's grown now. You've got like 180 thousand subscribers yeah. now. That's great. Yeah. And you've been awesome. running this channel, so it really shows the passion and drive that that folks have for what they're doing when they take something and build it from nothing and create such a big audience. I mean, you know, 180,000 people, that is a very large audience, especially for the seemingly kind of niche thing that you do. So, I mean, yeah. what else, other than hunting, you, you do some reloading stuff, some ballistics. Yeah. Tell us about some of your upcoming projects you got going on um, the channel. I think I've, I've always been a, a very technical, technical minded person. I will, I'll lie in bed and, and try and think about how things work. So for me, it's, it's all about um, trying to get the best out of my, my gun. So I'm, 
I've always been into precision shooting. Um, I started off with air guns. Um, shooting as a school sport has been around for a lot of schools in South Africa have, sh have shooting as a sport. Um, a few years ago, it was mostly with rim fires, um, and it was like like something that everyone did all the especially the boys schools guys would go out and and it would be part of a school sport where you can do shooting as a sport which is sure. fantastic i did um air rifle shooting at school as a sport and and that's kind of where my interest in this developed and um i, I was always interested in the technical stuff so how can i get the best accuracy out of my gun how does it work um understanding um you know th that's how i got into the reloading I, i've never fired factory ammunition out of any of my my rifles i've i've just got i've gone ahead, bought all the best reloading stuff, and from day one I've you know, worked really hard at load development, I want to get it perfect, and um, I'm one of those people who, if, if it's not as good as I think it should be, uh, I stress about it, and I, and I think that comes across in my, in my tutorials, I want to be able to share what I've learned through my, maybe op you can call it obsession, and um, just the little things I've learned how to get the best out of your setup, and whether that be air rifles or centerfire rifles, um, and try to bring that across in the form of tutorials on ballistics and reloading series and and just right. I enjoy being able to hear back from people that say I've, I've taught them something or they've learned something from me and I think that's important to share what you know and, and help build the community and build yeah I agree completely I mean especially from the standpoint you've been doing your channel since you were 16 and you've learned a lot as you've gone and you've you've developed as as a as a gun guy Yep. And then you've also shared that with everybody else. And that's a very humble thing to do. And I, I think that folks uh, should be commended for doing that. So that's great. Um, I think that relatively covers everything. So is there any points that I might have left off that you want to add to, to anything we talked about? I know, obviously, if someone is going to hunt in South Africa, you're encouraged to obviously get with whatever outfit that you're going to be yeah. with. And they're going to make sure that, you know, in terms of how you're traveling with firearms, you know, you obviously can travel with certain guns back and forth to go hunt. Uh, there is a process for it, just like anything else. Um, maybe one other thing that we didn't mention, trophies. Uh, okay. Trophy yeah. fees. I know that's something that some people kind of think about because everybody thinks, oh, well, I'm going to book a trip to go hunt in Africa. I'm going to go do this, going to go do that. But then they don't realize, uh, you know, then you start talking about importing a trophy and trophy fees. So explain that process. Like how big of a, of a industry taxidermy? Oh, taxidermy is, yeah, is let's, massive. Let's discuss that um, a little bit. I mean, I... I know a few people in the taxidermy business and there's one particular place in my hometown where I mean I've visited them and it's it's like a massive warehouse and there's about 50 people working full time and you just see crates being sent off huge crates all day every day it's it's such well hunting is such a huge industry and obviously if you're coming from overseas or even if you're a local hunter and you shoot something worth uh, worth telling a story about you, you want to take that home and be able to remember that every time you look at the animal. So taxidermy is something that I'm sure if you come to hunt South Africa you want to think about. Um, I don't necessarily know much about the process of having stuff sent over, but um, I can probably recommend some taxidermy places if anyone's interested, maybe put it Well, a your outfitter would and, also obviously yeah. know exactly you know what, what's going on in that regard. I mean, yeah. I know that that it's not always about trophies for, for everybody, and, and obviously some people it's, it's an experience. Yeah. And not only that, but the quality of meat, like you were telling me, yeah. that some, some of those uh, animals over there that are maybe not, you know, obviously not real common where I'm at, yeah. but have a food quality that in some cases is even better than beef. Yeah, I think... You were saying zebra is a good meat. Maybe like to, like to add is, I think the perception that a lot of American and, and globally p people have of hunting, um, just for, for example, species like zebra, giraffe, elephant, even um, hippo, people think that those animals don't get eaten. You know, you don't think of them as a as an animal as, as a food source, but um, the truth is, every single scrap of all of those animals are eaten. Um, even something like a giraffe, if you hunt a giraffe, none of that will go to waste. Um, in fact, I would I mean, even the organs get eaten. Um, the stuff that's not eaten by the person who shoots it will either get sold to a butchery, and the, and people will buy that meat, or a lot of it will get donated to communities that can't afford their own food. So, awesome. Actually, instead of instead of thinking of it as like destroying the environment or, or wasting meat it's actually providing a food source for people who can't afford food and they are when you see the the how grateful they are it, it changes your whole perception of it so yeah, yeah. I, I think if you if one of your friends goes and shoots a, a giraffe or a zebra which are very common animals by the way and are never in danger of being extinct um don't get the wrong idea of it because actually it's 
there's nothing wrong with doing that and mainstream media won't tell you that but that's how it is right and there's yeah. also you know just like anywhere else south africa i'm sure you can back me up on this it's a con con conservation effort yeah. that has to uh, you know has to happen so when you're talking uh, getting into various species of animals certain species might get a little bit large in the population they have to be kept in check a little bit yeah. because then that's that that herd of animals might you know affect this herd's ability to survive or this species to survive so in order to maintain a good balance between all the different species certain animals have to be cold and that's also genetics too i know yeah some of the high fence i say high fence we're talking huge pieces of property yeah massive. where you know the owners of these properties obviously they're wanting yeah. to keep their genetics in order so yeah taking out like a, a an animal who's maybe not in the breeding age, yeah. maybe he's gotten a little old, he can't breed anymore, then obviously get him out of the gene pool, those kind of things. Yeah. One thing you have to remember is that almost all property in South Africa is privately owned, and animals on, that, on those properties, because they have a value, because they can be hunted, because they have meat, because they've got beautiful skin, they've got a value to them, and so they have to be managed um, as, as something valuable. So obviously, landowners are gonna put half fences around their property to prevent their very, very expensive, let's say a rhinoceros that's been, that you have to hire an entire anti-poaching unit to protect it because of poaching. That costs money. If the, if the rhino gets sick, that's got to be, you got to get a vet in to look after it. That all costs money. And um, you know, it, the, the whole management of the farm hinges on hunting because if you don't hunt anything, the animals will get out of control, they'll overgraze and they'll end up dying anyway. And um, this, the fact that Predators in South Africa, natural predators, they they more kind of isolated to specific areas now, like big national parks and a lot of um, big game farms will also farm sheep and stuff. So you can't have lions and sheep on the same farm. It's just not going to work. And so the hunters coming in actually help the population to stay not only very healthy, but at good numbers. An example of this would be a black wildebeest, which in the 1960s was almost completely extinct. When they, in, when they said a black wildebeest can be hunted, they made it legal to hunt black wildebeest. Everyone, you know, everyone thought, oh, this is a stupid law, they're all gonna be shot, shot out. But all of a sudden, because that animal had a value to it, the landowners were buying black wildebeest on auction, they were breeding them, and their populations absolutely exploded because they now have a value. They can be hunted, uh, hunters will come over and pay to shoot them, more than you'd pay to take a photograph of it. So, you know, sometimes you say, you know, what's the point of hunting the animal if you can just make money as having a game park where you can just drive past and take pictures? If you're willing to pay $2,000 to take a picture, then go ahead. But that's, it's not a viable way to, to um, sustainably keep the population healthy. And so, yeah. When you're talking to a fenced in property too, I mean, you're talking millions, sometimes yeah, millions million of acres. acres. It, you're yeah. not talking a small amount of property. So it's not like they're in cages or anything. So yeah. Um, is there anything else we really need to cover? Anything that just jumps out that would be something specific somebody needs to know while we got the camera going here? Don't think so. <laughs> is that pretty pretty well covered? Pretty well covered. Well, uh, you know, Matt, thanks so much for uh, making this video with me. We like to, you know, anytime we get folks from around the world, we love to make these videos because we feel that it provides a bit of perspective from around the world. And I believe, and, and people may or may not agree with me, but I feel that a lot of Americans, specifically, excuse me, uh, sort of suffer from a bit of lack of culture, okay? You know, we're such a, in some cases, a closed-minded group of people that sometimes we get so involved in our own little struggle and our own little world and our own little life and we live in this social media bubble and TVs yeah. and computers that sometimes it, it's good to just step back and understand the perspective of someone else. And I feel that that is something that uh, some, sometimes we lack and sometimes it's nice to kind of stand back and understand what our brothers and sisters around the world are going through. And uh, that gun culture is a lot more widely accepted than a lot of folks would probably have you believe. And a lot yeah. of the folks on the other side of the fence in terms of the anti-gun realm would have you believe that, oh, uh, Americans are, you know, we're all psychos that just like our gun culture and blah, 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 all this. But really, gun culture is a pretty widely accepted thing around other yeah. parts of the world. There's many other like-minded people uh, around the world other than just us. So we have to think about others as well as ourselves. So we want to make this video. I thought it'd be fun. Uh, Matt's been hanging out here for a day or two. We've been filming some stuff. So expect some more videos here. And make sure you go over and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Again, it's Air Arms Hunting SA. All right, you'll see a, a link down in the description box below. Make sure you subscribe to Matt's channel because uh, he's got some great stuff. And it's a really awesome perspective because you're literally going to get the perspective 
that is completely different of anybody, what anybody in the U.S. is doing. Obviously, I can't go and hunt baboons and, and do all this <laughs> random cool stuff that this guy's doing. So make sure you check out his channel. He's putting a lot of effort into his work, and uh, he's been doing it since he was 16. And uh, it's really cool to uh, support guys like Matt. I feel like uh, it's, it's always a great thing to get a bit, a di bit of, excuse me, different perspective with what we're dealing with, so um, we feel it's important. So make sure you subscribe to his channel. And Matt, thanks for joining me today. Uh, this is not a video I get to make very often because we, we typically don't have a ton of folks uh, visiting from around the world, but when they do, we like to put together yeah. this type of video if they're willing. So uh, thanks for educating folks a bit. Yeah. And uh, make sure you subscribe to his channel. And anything you want to say before we go here? Uh, yeah, I just want to say uh, it's always a privilege to come over to the U.S. and. And I think uh, I do want to say you guys are really blessed to have the, the freedom you have here with, with firearms. And I hope you are able to hold on to that because it's really something special. You heard it from him. Yeah. All right. So, guys, thank you very much for watching today's video. And uh, we'll see you next time. Many more videos on the way.